So we're talking about the next generation, the generation that follows the, the millennials, and we're also reflecting on how Jesus is for this generation as well as many others. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, we're going to start at verse 18. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? So, I, Jen, the generation after the millennials, Born 1995 through 2012, approximately, anyways. These are people, we either know kids like this, or people like this. Some of these people are adults now. They grew up with cell phones. They had an Instagram account before high school. And they don't remember a time without the internet. So they were formed and raised in conditions that the rest of us were not, and it has had an impact on the kind of people that many of them are. Not all of the trends apply to all of them the same, but there's a, it's a different day today than it was when the rest of us grew up. So there's different generations, and there's some approximate dates up on the screen here. Boomers, there's Generation X, which is where I am, I was 1979, so I'm barely in there. Uh, Then there's the Millennials, and then iGen. iGen is unique, but Jesus is for every generation. So it doesn't matter when you were born, what influences or times shaped you and formed you, Jesus is for you. And even though it's a very different day today than it was when... Some of us grew up, Jesus is still for this generation, it's still for this time. So this generation, I, the I and I gen stands for internet, it stands for individualism, it stands for insecure, we'll talk more about that in coming weeks, it stands for inclusive, irreligious, and also insulated, that's what we're going to focus on today. This is an insulated generation. But let's talk about this passage here. The call to follow Jesus is a radical one. As you saw from those first verses there, verse 19, the scribe, he's willing to cross the lake with Jesus. He's about to get onto this boat, and the scribe said, hey, wherever you're going, I'll go with you. And then... Jesus gives him kind of a peculiar response. It's a little bit of a riddle. Verse 20, Jesus says, he's not going to stop moving. This scribe says, I'll go with you across to the other side of the lake, wherever you might be landing. And Jesus says, well, essentially he says, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to keep going. I'm, I have a lot of work to do. I'm not going to just rest anywhere. There's a lot of places I need to go and preach. I need to heal people and so forth. He's not going to stop moving. He has no nesting place. 
Jesus was a carpenter's son, as we know. And uh, being a carpenter wasn't the most lucrative sort of a job that you could have, but it was a stable job, and it paid the bills. And so, for a long time, when he grew up, he was a carpenter, and then he left his stable and secure job and just started traveling all over the place and did his ministry. He left that security to do God's work. So he's saying following me means leaving your home, your job, and your security. And he's asking this scribe, can you handle that? Can you handle giving up that security that you have? Back then, people didn't move very often. It was rare to move. You, us- you, you were born, you got married, and you died, usually in the same place. And you tended to live even right next to your parents all the time, and even maybe in the same compound, maybe even in the same house. Family was your security. If you're traveling all over the place, then you're separated from your family and you don't have that security. Can you give up your security to follow Jesus? Even to this day, doing God's will might mean losing your job. It might mean losing your livelihood. It might mean losing your reputation. Can you handle that? The call of Jesus is not a casual one. It's a radical one. He asks us to give up things that we otherwise might be even crazy for giving up. So it's, we don't know exactly what happened with this scribe, but it seems, it seems like he didn't go along. And in verse 21, there's another guy, it says one of his disciples, who says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. I, I'd like to follow you, I, I, I believe what you're saying, but... But uh, I, I have a father to bury yet. Now this request is not the least unreasonable. At that time, burial was one of the most important of family duties. Burial was very important back then. I'm still trying to understand that. But having a proper burial was very important back then. You wanted to be buried in your hometown and even in your family's tomb. And to be buried properly was very important. People attached proper burial to a good afterlife and, and other things like that. So that, that was really important to them. And so one of your most important duties, especially if you were an oldest son, was to bury your father as well as your mother. Even in the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know about all of these rules for the priests that they have to follow and how if you do this, you're unclean and then you have to purify yourself. Well, one thing that makes you unclean was touching something that was dead. That made you unclean. That means you couldn't go into the tabernacle and do the proper sacrifices and everything. So then you had to go through some purification to get clean. Well, burial is so important that there was an exception for this. So if you were even a priest in the Old Testament, and a close and immediate, somebody in your immediate family died, you were allowed to touch that dead person and not be defiled because you needed to bury them. That's how important burial was. God gave them an exception from being unclean just so that they could bury people, bury people in their immediate family. Jewish tradition connected burying parents with honor your father and mother. So everybody who was following this Old Testament was saying, you know, burying your parents, that, that's one of the big parts of honoring your father and your mother. If you want to honor your father and mother, then you better give them a proper burial. That's, that's your duty. That's your job. That's your role. And the tradition, the tradition of the the elders there, it permitted burial to take priority over all other commandments. 
even the essential prayers. It actually says this, He who is confronted by a dead relative is freed from reciting the Shema, from the 18 benedictions, and from all the commandments stated in the Torah. That's how important burial was. You're exempted from all of it so that you can bury your family. So, this man saying, Lord, I'm, I want to follow you, but I, but I need to bury my father. So, even the most devout person at that time would have said, well, obviously that's your family duty. That's, that's following the fourth commandment. So, sure, go for it. Now, we should mention here that we don't know, we don't know exactly what this man's situation was, whether his dad had just died and he needed to bury him that day and maybe have some funeral services after that. We, so we don't know whether he's saying, Lord, I need, I need a week. Or we don't know if his dad was still alive. Maybe his health was failing, but he needed an uncertain amount of time. We don't know exactly. But either way, Jesus' answer is the same. And it's a harsh answer. If this, this came from anybody else besides Jesus, this would be highly offensive. Anyone who doesn't follow me is as good as dead. Ouch. Anybody who doesn't follow me is as good as dead. Even your family. Wow. It's quite, a, it's quite a tall order to follow Jesus. When you follow Jesus, you, you actually get a new family. It's called the family of God, or broadly speaking, the church. And this is your family. And there's a lot of people who leave biological families in order to follow Jesus. And their families, their biological families disown them, and so they have a new family now that's called the church. And it's so wonderful to have a, a new family. I'm looking out at a lot of you and I see a lot of people who are really close with their biological families and it's, and it's great, but there's a lot of people who get disowned by their biological families because they follow Jesus. And they need that church family. So, it's a tall order to follow Jesus and then... Jesus gets into this boat, and then there's this big storm. It was on the Sea of Galilee, and this is a sea that is notorious for storms that just pop up out of nowhere all of a sudden. I remember asking my grandpa once, he, would, he had a sailboat and he would sail up the coast of Lake Michigan and into Lake Huron, and I remember asking him once, have you ever sailed on Lake Superior? And he said, no, I'm never going to sail on Lake Superior. He said, because storms can come up on Lake Superior real quick, and there's not very many places where you can dock. Sea of Galilee was like that. Storms would just come up like that, and this was one of those times. But following Jesus means you can face danger without fear. It says in verse 24 that the waves were sweeping over the boat. This is a freshwater lake. And when you're in fresh water, the water kind of dips and curves much sharper. Whereas in the salt seas, there's more swells. They say it's much more dangerous to go boating or to ship something in fresh water than in salt water because of the waves and how it works. The waves were sweeping over the boat. And these were experienced fishermen. I want to remind you that. These experienced fishermen thought they were going to die. This is not the first storm they've seen. It's, and they thought it was going to be their last. They've seen many storms. This was nothing new, but they thought they were going to die. Now you can imagine that if you're somebody who's been on the water a long time, some of these people their whole life, and they've seen many storms come and go, had many close calls, and they, you, you start to get pretty confident after a while. 
Oh, this is no big deal. This is no big deal. So when it is actually a big deal, you know it's a big deal. Because it's kind of pride that starts to develop after you've had a lot of experience. So if these people who've had all this experience and have this pride built up of, I'm, I'm navigating these waters, I know this lake like the back of my hand, they're saying we're going to die, you know you're in trouble. In fact, in the Greek there, their, their words, it's only three words there. Basically say, Lord, save, we perish. It's only three words. They only have time to get three words out. And Jesus was sleeping. I like that. He was sleeping through a storm that was basically going to kill them. They were going to drown, and he was asleep, sound asleep. Like, nothing to worry about. But following Jesus means you can face danger without fear because all creation bows even to Jesus' commands, even winds and sea. Jesus gets up and commands them and they obey like that. If you believe in Jesus, that means that you have Him with you. That means that if that was you on that boat there, you could have been asleep too and not had to worry. When you're on God's mission, as Jesus was, He knew it would be fine. He knew God would take care of them. And He did. So, this generation, let's take a look at how this passage applies here. More than past generations, I Jenners like being kids and are slow to grow up. Just this week, there was a man, a 30-year-old man, who was ordered by the court to leave his parents' house. And uh, just look that story up. That's quite a story. They, people, people who are growing up right now, more than others, not every last one of you, these are trends. But people like being kids now. So... I wish that I could return to the security of childhood when they poll seniors every year. The number of seniors who are answering that positively, saying, yes, I agree with that, that's going up right now. And it has been going up for a while. Or the happiest time in life is when you are a child, that's growing up. More and more seniors are saying, yes, I agree with that. IGEN is less likely to go on dates they are less likely to get a driver's license. They are less likely to have a job, a paying job, that is. In the late 70s, 22% of high school seniors didn't work for pay, only 22%. In 2010, it was 44, twice that amount. And those who do work actually work fewer hours. Now, maybe. Maybe some of you are thinking, well, maybe that's because other things are, are becoming more demanding. Like, maybe school is more demanding. No, not really. High school seniors, the ones heading to college in 2015, spent four fewer hours on all of these activities combined. Homework, paid work, volunteer work, extracurricular work. Four fewer hours a week than those in 1987. So from the book, I just, just this little part here. She interviewed a lot of people from this generation. When I asked 20 I Jenners why being a child was better than being an adult, almost all said that being an adult involved too much responsibility. When they were children, they said their parents had taken care of everything and they'd just gotten to have fun. I could take care of my own desires more or less, without ever having to worry about the logistics or practicality of making them real, wrote Elizabeth, 22. Nor was I ever really forced to encounter the consequences of having fun or taking a day off. It was just something I would do. In other words, as children, they could live in a cocoon with all the fun but little of the work. 
Their parents made childhood a wonderful place with lots of praise and emphasis on fun and few responsibilities. No wonder they don't want to grow up. Again, these are trends. This doesn't apply to every last person. But there's, there's a trend right now that children don't really want to grow up. Now, I want to point out something. Jesus lived and worked at home until he was 30. So he wasn't exactly somebody to just up and leave home that quickly either. So it's not wrong to live at home, even when you're an adult. That's not wrong. But there is a tendency to want the security of having your parents take care of you and to not have your own responsibility. Whereas Jesus is saying here, particularly to this this scribe, he's calling him to leave this security to follow him. Give up your security to follow me, is what Jesus says. And he says it to all of us. Give up your security and follow me. Stop relying on yourselves. Stop relying on others. Rely on me instead. Matthew 13 This really illustrates what it means to give up your security. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field, selling everything to buy it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. He sold everything to get one thing. Selling everything to get one thing. This is what Jesus is calling us to do. Giving up our security. I Jenners are also attached to their parents, as a rule, anyways. I Gen is less likely to go out without their parents. I know that when I was growing up, I really wanted to get out and be with friends and leave mom and dad at home. But there's a trend right now that kids want to go out without, or with their parents actually. 12th graders in 2015 were going out less often than 8th graders in 2009. So in 2015, high school seniors are going out less often than 8th graders in 2009. Staying home is kind of the thing. They're less likely to be home without their parents too. And this was an interesting statistic. For the first time ever in 2014, More 18 to 34-year-olds were living with parents than with a spouse or even a romantic partner. So we have trends here that are saying children are really attached to their parents. And if the other other statements are, are true, if parents are creating this wonderful environment where children can stay children even when they're, you know, going into adulthood, it's not hard to see why. There's a lot of attachment to parents. It's quite a contrast with what Jesus was saying to that disciple of his, or the would-be disciple. Christ followers honor their parents, but are not attached to them. Parents are, parents are wonderful people. They form us, they shape us. But Jesus' words here are quite shocking. Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. It's quite, quite a call. Our Heavenly Father is greater than our earthly father and mother. As, one, as much as we might love them. And Christ, our brother, is greater than any brothers or sisters we have. As much as we love them, Christ calls us to love Him more. Jesus says, don't suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. He says this in Matthew 10. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Wow. And then a little later, in Matthew 12, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting him to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Then stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. If you follow Jesus, family takes on a whole new meaning. iGen is easily, easily the safest generation. This is the generation that grew up in car seats until they were in school. They're picked up at school. They don't walk home anymore. They played in sanitized plastic playgrounds, supervised at every moment. In 1969, almost half of elementary and middle schoolers walked or rode their bike to school. Almost half of them. In 2009, only 13% did. There was, there's a story about how there was one set of parents who let their kids walk a mile to school and somebody called CPS on them because of negligence. How could you let your kids walk that far to school? The words keep safe and stay safe in American books took a sharp increase beginning in the mid-90s, so safety is a big deal to us now. And that's been passed on to our kids, which is a good thing in many ways. iGen is much less likely to be in a car accident or get a traffic ticket. We have a lot of safe drivers. iGeners wear their seat belts. The amount of People in this generation who say, I always wear my seatbelt, I don't even think about it, that's going way up. So we're raising kids who wear their seatbelts and drive safe. As a rule, anyways. Not every last individual, perhaps. iGen is much less likely to get in a car driven by somebody who is drinking. They know that that's not safe. And so they don't. That was actually cut in half between 1991 and 2015 iGen is much less likely to binge drink, too. Good thing. Much less likely to be in a physical fight. That's going way down. In uh, 1991, half of ninth graders were in a physical fight. Half of them. In 2015, it's only one in four. So, there's some good things about that. We're being more safe. Being more practical. Homicide is going way down. It reached, our uh, teens and young adults, it reached a 40-year low in 2014. So these are, good, these are good trends. iGen is less likely, much less likely to agree with this. I like to test myself every now and then by doing something a little risky. So the next generation doesn't really want to take chances anymore. So they stay at home, they drive carefully, and avoid anything that might be dangerous, just to be safe. And this is good in many ways. There's some, it kind of goes a little too far though too, in some ways. So for example, there's kind of this this notion of avoiding all risks of any kind. So for example, This generation is much less likely to want to own their own business than other generations were at the same age. There's these places on college campuses now that are called safe spaces. And even saying anything that somebody disagrees with can bring tears. So we don't even want to risk somebody disagreeing with us because that's going to hurt our feelings.
we can't even disagree or anybody can have it, even an offensive viewpoint anymore. So this is kind of, this is a sentence from the book. We protect children from danger, real and imaginary, and are then surprised when they go off to college and create safe spaces designed to repel the real world. As a rule, anyway. The iGen trend is to be riskless when Jesus calls us to risk everything. And this is a challenge for any generation. Risk everything. But that's what he's called. Even risk your family and friends, your house and your home and your income and your security. Jesus says, put that all aside to follow me. It's a tall order. Let's look at the screen here. Let's answer this. What further advantage do we receive? You notice it says advantage. Advantage to receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross. Through Christ's death, our old selves are crucified, put to death, and buried with Him so that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer rule us, but that instead we may dedicate ourselves as an offering of gratitude to Him. We dedicate our entire lives to Him. Just as Jesus gave His entire life for us, He says, anybody who doesn't take His cross and follow Me is not worthy of Me. Give your whole life to Me. So if your highest goals in your heart and in your mind are material things, perhaps, or pleasing other people, or momentary pleasures and gains, then you're not going to like following Jesus because He calls you to give up those things. But He is worth the risk. It's a risk to follow Jesus because you might lose everything. But He's worth the risk. He's worth the risk because His blessings are divine. Jesus is not just some guy. He's God in flesh. If you follow Him and you have Him, then you have God. God is greater than anything that we could possibly have. The blessing of having Jesus is divine. Can anything compare with having Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Philippians 3.8 I count everything as a loss, everything, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Just knowing Him. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Everything else is garbage. So He's worth the risk because when you have God, when you know God Himself, and you have something that is directly from heaven, then everything that's here and now is just garbage. He's worth the risk because His safety is eternal. We might like to think of safety as for the here and now, but the safety that Christ offers is eternal. So that even if the worst case scenario were to happen to you here and now, your eternity is secure. Romans 8.35 Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? What's going to separate us? Even if the worst case scenario happened to you, your eternity is secure. Your, the love of Christ is still with you. Nothing compares to that. He is worth the risk. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, um, we are so glad that you risked it all so that we could belong to you. Lord, help us to, to see that and to see that it is worth it. Even as you took that route, we pray that we would take that route too. That we would love you with all of our hearts. And count everything else as even rubbish and garbage compared to just knowing you and having you. 
We pray that we would know you and know the blessings that come from you so that we would see that and grow in that knowledge. In Jesus' name, amen.